Hello there, AP World students. Let's keep Unit 5 going with the Industrial Revolution. Let's learn all about it. Here we go. Okay, so let me remind you guys what was going on in Europe before the Industrial Revolution kicks off. The Second Agricultural Revolution was happening, and if you remember, the Second Agricultural Revolution was there was a lot of new changes happening in the world of farming. Uh, and it was especially about machines and specialized tools making farming significantly more easier and making it use significantly less human labor. For basically the entirety of world history, the vast majority of people on planet Earth were full-time farmers, and with these new inventions like Jethro Tull's seed drill, techniques like crop rotation, and then these plethora of other new tools that are coming out in the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, farmers are just not as valuable anymore. Um, less and less people are needed to work on the farms, and these tools are going to make it so that all those former farmers kind of need somewhere to go, need a new livelihood to make. Um, yeah, and this is definitely the, the, the causation of the Industrial Revolution, for sure. Um, and the fact that now food is significantly more reliable, significantly more easily available, uh, people are going to now live longer, healthier lives. The average human body is going to grow like a foot. Um, so it's it's going to be pretty cool. And uh, I would say the, the, the major invention from the second agricultural revolution is Jethro Tull's seed drill. And here's a picture of it right here. It's not a complicated machine. It's like a, a wheelbarrow that has three parts to it. A part that cuts a trench in the ground, a funnel that puts seeds in the ground, and then a sort of reverse shovel at the end to cover up the hole. So you just sort of push this thing along your uh, your farmland, and uh, it's significantly more easy than having a crew of guys just dig holes and plant seeds all day. Um, okay, so yeah, here's just some more statistics about this stuff. Um, so between 10,000 BC to 1700 AD, 95% of all people on planet Earth worked as full-time farmers. You absolutely had an ancestor who was a full-time farmer. And, I mean, maybe some of you still have family members who are farmers today, but it's significantly less, less uh, of a thing. Um, yeah, these, these techniques to growing food make it so that food's just unbelievably easily available. And this agricultural revolution continues to this day. It's making almost exponential gains. We are not going to go hungry, okay? Food is, food's easy to make now. Uh, today in America, only 1.7% of our population are full-time farmers. And America is so efficient at growing food, we could grow food for 8 billion people if we put our farms at full capacity. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible stuff. And I, I deep dived into this in my human geography class, but I'll just leave it at that for... For world history um, but the the larger context though is now that farming is so easy and doesn't need as many people all these former farmers they're gonna go to cities to look for new work and a better life um, and this concept of cities are now going to be growing and becoming significantly a more uh, important part of well not only the Western world but of the entire world this concept is called urbanization the growth of cities. All right, and yeah, I've got some graphs here and it just shows you that uh, people are now living way longer and that farm jobs are only 1.7% of America's industry. It's pretty crazy. Uh, okay, so all these former farmers are moving into cities just in mass, okay? And it was, it was a notable change in the kind of mid 1800s when all these people are moving at the same time. Um, so they're going to build these giant housing projects called tenements. And uh, you'd see these in probably just about every major city in the, the Western world. And um, typically tenements, you'd have like 10 people living in one room. Okay. Um, yeah, I call them closet sized apartments. I don't think that's an exaggeration. No water, no electricity, no toilets, no city garbage services. This was sort of the, the beginning of what life in a city is supposed to look like. And it took, it took a while for uh, society to kind of catch up and realize, like, maybe we should have building codes. Maybe the government should provide a trash collection service. So it, in the beginning, it was kind of a mess. 
but um, it, it does get more or less sorted out by the time we get to the mid 1900s. I mean, some cities in India still kind of look like this, though. Uh, but yeah, tenement apartments. You don't want to live in a tenement. All right, let me uh, let me look at this one right here. How many guys are here? One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> one room, and I think that's probably also their kitchen as well. Yeah, this lady's got the baby's crib right next to a stove, probably a boiling water. Oh, there's there's these are some bad decisions. All right, moving on. Okay, so now I'm actually getting into the the main event here, the first industrial revolution. Now, when I'm presenting it. You're going to think that it was sort of like one thing easily led to another. That was not the case, okay? The Industrial Revolution was this kind of long, uneven process. It definitely involved people from all over uh, Europe and the United States. And the overall theme of the Industrial Revolution is we are switching the way the economy runs from human labor to machine labor. Um, it definitely sort of got started on the farms, but that's referred to as the agricultural revolution. The industrial revolution is people are now working in factories. Factories is the industrial revolution. Um, and I'm gonna argue this is the most incredible period of change in the history of the world. There's definitely good things about it and uh, there's definitely bad things about it. But the, the short of it is, is once your country develops factories and becomes a, a manufacturing economy, uh, your country never ever goes back and your country sort of enters the uh, the elite team of of economic producers on planet Earth. So let's uh, check out what factory life looks like. Okay, the important thing to know is the United Kingdom started it. The United Kingdom is the origin point, it is the hearth of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and just some really smart dudes in the UK were like, hey, we got all these farmers moving into the city. We got to do something with them. Let's put them in front of a machine and let's have the machine do a lot of the work and the factory workers will just kind of manage the machines. Um, and uh, yeah, I've already kind of mentioned this, but definitely got this in your notes. Industrialized economies, countries that do go through the Industrial Revolution, they're going to be the only major players in world economics for the rest of human history. If you don't have factories, you don't matter. That's kind of the, the harsh reality. Um, and uh, Britain did have a lot of early advantages, okay? And when people always ask, like, why did Britain come up with the first factories? Well, they had a ton of uh, ore and coal, iron ore and coal, I should have put a comma there, on their island. And, um, yeah, the, the British, like, I could also get into how, like, the joint stock companies sort of created this sense of entrepreneurship and, uh, and business acumen. So, of course, there was a lot more kind of creative energy in the United Kingdom than there were in some other countries, but uh, they're the ones that kicked it off and everybody just starts copying them. And uh, I've got this uh, little flow map here that shows that it started in the UK and then it kind of moved to maybe the Netherlands and then it went to Germany and France and then kind of to Poland and eventually to Russia. And all these countries to a degree will become industrialized, some more than others, of course. Um, Okay, so yeah, and then here's just a bigger list. Why did Europe start the Industrial Revolution? Well, the concept of mercantilism definitely benefited it. Mercantilism was just, we're taking in all these raw resources from other parts of the world, and we're going to assemble them and put them together in Europe. So they've already got these ships coming in from everywhere, bringing in uh, cotton to make clothes, and bringing in iron ore to, to smelt into more iron. They're bringing in um, silver ore so they could turn it into silver coins like they're doing all kinds of stuff um, bringing in the resources to them so now they're processing the resources in these factories um, yeah Europe Europe just surprisingly had way more coal than other countries did and just about all these machines are gonna start off being coal powered uh, all these pictures down here they're just shooting off that burned coal soot into the uh, atmosphere it's definitely gonna cause a lot of pollution um, yeah, the increasing availability of workers, that was another huge issue, and I've mentioned that multiple times. Um, and here's some other things, too. The Enlightenment did also kind of lead into the Industrial Revolution. It's this idea that you are a free person, you have private property, you have your own rights, so you should be able to, to come up with new ideas and take economic risks. Um, and that's something I could definitely go on for a long time and comment about, that if a country has more 
freedoms for its people, if the people are encouraged to, to think for themselves, they will be more inclined to create things. Um, that's why like, there's not a lot of stuff being invented in North Korea or being invented in China because it's, it's not as a, a free, open society as they are in the West. Um, haven't had the Enlightenment over there. Uh, lots of easily navigable rivers. Yeah, that's true, because uh, some parts of the world are really hard to get to, but if you've got a really awesome river, you can just kind of sail up and down the river and deliver goods, and Europe has a ton of rivers. Um, I think I think I recall reading somewhere that Europe has the most navigatable rivers per land area than any other continent in the world. So that's definitely an advantage for the Europeans. All right, moving on. So now let's just talk about inventions. I got inventions for days. So the big inventions that absolutely kicked off the Industrial Revolution were the steam engine, which led into steam ships, which led into the combustion engine. And James Watts is kind of the guy who's given a lot of credit for this. But the thing I really just have to emphasize to, to all my students is it's so hard to give one inventor credit for any given invention. Usually it was like one guy created a really crappy version of a steam engine that was really expensive and really hard to make. And then James Watt finds it and he's like, oh, hey, I'm gonna improve upon this and make it almost a different invention, but it sort of is the same, making it way better. Um, yeah, so these are the people that are generally given historical credit, but recognize could not be the case always. Um, and anyway, the steam engine, game changer okay totally game changer because for all of human history the only way people could get anywhere was by walking slash running riding an animal or going on a ship that was powered by the wind or human oars that was it no other ways of moving around for the entirety of human history then we get the steam engine the steam ships we got trains uh, we're going now way faster. We're way more reliable. We can work through all kinds of weather. Um, it's, it's a whole new world and history is going to move way, way faster because people are now moving way, way faster. Um, okay, yeah, so here's graphs about the world population. This is, this is also incredible stuff too. Once the, for, for basically all of human history, it's fair to say there were about a billion people on planet Earth. It was, you know, sometimes went up and down like the Black Death and the Mongols and stuff, but it's just, your brain can easily remember by saying one billion people existed on planet Earth. Once we get the second agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, the world population starts growing almost exponentially, okay? Um, and you see that graph right there, it shows you that, uh, what is this, 200 years ago, we were at that 1 billion people mark, and now we're at 7.5 billion. Um, and hey, if you wanna know how far it'll get, go to my human geography class. I covered that in, in a full length uh, stuff there. But um, yeah, so the world population is now exploding, and also the world economy is exploding. Here's a graph showing GDP per person. The vast majority of human history, everybody was just broke as a joke. And the vast majority of human history, China was on top, okay? Like, it wasn't even close. China was just the richest place on planet Earth. But as soon as the Industrial Revolution happens, the beginning of the 1800s, now all these other countries are shooting up there and uh, surpassing China. But maybe nowadays China's catching up to us, so it's, you know, his history isn't done yet, kids. Um, but, yeah, once you have an industrial economy, you just beat everybody by light years. So it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, okay, so, and I've, I've implied this with uh, steam engines, it's all about coal. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, coal was the only material that people largely used to power these machines and these steam engines and these steam ships. So, uh, yeah, like, and here's some, some graph statistics, or some, uh, a chart, is that a chart? No, this is a table, that's what you call this, this is a table. So in 1800, they only mined one ton of coal in all of Europe, okay? Like coal was like largely worthless. But then we get to 1850, they're mining 30 tons. We get to 1880, 300 million tons? Like, oh my gosh. Like you, you just, you in 30 years, you increased your factor of coal production by 10 million. That's wild to me. 
and you only doubled the miners. So clearly they found some new techniques to mine coal and they're probably using machines to mine coal. So you don't even need as many people. Um, and uh, yeah, by 1914, coal, it's, I mean, it's still important. We're mining, what, 250 million of it if this thing goes away. Um, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah, the, so the last part is 1914, 250 million tons of coal, but that's because we find other sources of energy, hashtag oil, that become more successful than coal. But just know, start of the Industrial Revolution, coal was the game changer. Uh, it's really what made the world turn into machine land. But let me just warn you something about coal. Very, very polluting substance. Okay, like a lot of the cities in Europe during this time period, just no sky, all black soot. You breathe it in, it's like you're smoking a cigarette. Like it was, it was not a healthy environment if you're around a lot of burning coal. Uh, all right, so now we're getting into what is known as the Second Industrial Revolution. Um, and here's the thing. The Second Industrial Revolution followed right after the first one. I, I usually teach it as it was just one contiguous Industrial Revolution, but the College Board wants to emphasize that the first part was all about steam engines and coal, and the second part is all about everything else, but they, they followed each other directly. Okay, so this is now in the later 1800s, so we're kind of past the year 1850. All these new inventions involving chemicals, oil power, steel, electricity, it's just building off the steam engine and continuing this new world of machines and creativity. And uh, yeah, so let's, let's learn about some new aspects in the second industrial revolution. Okay, something you gotta know, the Bessemer process. Now, uh, you're, well, really all the world, well, except for like the Native Americans, but just about all the world was using steel uh, for the last 2,000 years. But to make steel was really difficult. Like you'd have to be an expert blacksmith. You'd have to like uh, heat the metal just right and mold it just right. And like half the time you'd probably fail and it was super expensive. So for the most part, people didn't really use a lot of steel for most of human history. But then we get this dude, Henry Bessemer, who comes up with this idea. He says, what if I melt iron ore and I melt it at this incredibly high degree and I blast it with air? And he finds out that if he blasts it with air, it'll just mold the iron ore into just perfect steel. And he can then you know, make steel way, way cheaper, way more effectively, and it's even stronger steel than whatever a blacksmith could possibly make. But the Bessemer process requires these big, giant oil foundries like the ones pictured here, and it's, you know, really kind of dangerous and complicated, but Henry Bessemer figured it out, and now steel is just easy to acquire, and we got steel and everything, and we have steel for days, so we can make these big, giant steel structures like skyscrapers, so... It's uh, and giant steel ships. And once you have a ship made out of steel, uh, guns and cannonballs are worthless, okay? Like a steel ship, it's functionally invincible compared to all the old uh, forms of, of warfare. So they find that out really quickly. Um, but yeah, so anyway, the Bessemer process totally changes uh, the landscape in that steel is now widely available everywhere. All right, now we got this dude, Thomas Edison. Uh, his, we could have a whole historical discussion over uh, whether he's the legit inventor of some of this stuff. Um, but anyway, Thomas Edison is credited with a thousand plus inventions. Like, I think it's uh, the movie camera, the speaker, the audio recorder, but the big one he's known for is the light bulb. And the light bulb, I'm gonna argue, is maybe as important or more important than the steam engine because now humans can efficiently work in the dark. Before the light bulb, the only way you could see at night was to have a, a, a flame-based uh, thing near you. And so many times people would like screw up and drop the candle or drop the lantern, set everything on fire, it would be terrible. So once you have a light bulb, you can now easily have vision <laughs> in uh, various places that otherwise the sun can't reach. And you can also have vision at night. So it more than doubled global productivity with this one invention alone. And today we now have fluorescent light bulbs and everything's even more efficient today. So thanks Thomas Edison 
But uh, you did kind of screw over some other people that deserve credit for inventions. So I'll tell you that much. Um, okay, and now we get to this dude, Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company. Uh, Henry Ford, he did not invent the car, okay? Like, other dudes invented the car, and it's really complicated because one guy kind of, like, invented a really terrible engine, and then a guy improved on the engine, and then a guy invented an oil engine, so it's, 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 it's hard to put a defining definition on it. But for the purposes of this class... Henry Ford invented the efficient, affordable car, okay? There, there's no sense in saying, I've invented a spaceship that you can buy for $10 billion, but if somebody invents a spaceship that you can sell for $1,000, well, then, you know, that person's going to change the world. And that's kind of the idea of Henry Ford here. So how did Henry Ford make cars so cheaply and so efficiently? He created this concept called interchangeable parts and the assembly line. These two things are really, really important. Um, the assembly line is this strategy in a factory where you have a hundred workers in the factory and each worker has one very specific job. You say, look, you're the wheel guy. All you're gonna do is put wheels on the chassis and push it down to the next guy. You're the glass guy. You're gonna put the glass on the car and you're gonna push it down to the next guy. And because in the past, a lot of factories sort of had one worker do all the various pieces. And usually the worker would like screw up some of those pieces. And it was also really inefficient. People are running around all over the place. Things are getting lost. Um, and, and also in the past too, in the early factories, people tried to make items on order. You know, people would be like, I want a... Uh, a blanket with this kind of pattern on it and I want it to be this color so then they would have to change out the machines and put in different um, patterns and different colors but Henry Ford said there's going to be none of that okay people are not going to make cars on request I'm going to make all the cars exactly the same they're all going to be black they're all going to be this exact size so people are just going to have to deal with it um, and yeah, this concept of interchangeable parts, every car was made exactly the same way. Every piece, it's, it's sort of like a big Lego set, you know? It's like everything totally clicks together. Um, when in the past, in factories, people would try to customize things all the time. So he didn't care about any of that. Um, but yeah, he sold cars for 25% of the price of his competitors. I mean, look, cars were still expensive back then and, you know, early... 1900s late 1800s dollars but uh his, his car absolutely changed the world and made factories even more effective than they already were um we got this little fun fact on the side right here uh during the uh, beginning parts of the industrial revolution workers typically worked six days a week people typically only got sunday off but henry ford lobbied congress and passed a lot of legislation and he created the idea of this weekend where people also got saturday off as well as having sunday off so uh it's it's a fact of life that henry ford can be attributed that he gave us saturdays off for the rest of human history so let's let's give a round of applause for henry ford for uh for giving us saturdays off because uh without without his idea we'd probably be teaching uh monday through saturday and you'd only have sunday off so all right, good job, Henry Ford, Li living it up. All right, now we're talking about oil. So the second uh, industrial revolution, I mean, they still used a ton of coal, like no doubt, and actually we still use coal today, but the second industrial revolution was the one that oil kind of becomes the new focused resource uh, for the world. Um, and initially, like humans have, we've known about oil forever okay like there's this black stuff in the ground it's kind of gooey it's like what is it um well uh we initially figured out you could use oil for lamps and like keep those you know kerosene lit lamps going um and for 50 years the byproducts of crude oil including gasoline of all things we just dumped them into rivers we're like this stuff is worthless it's it's we, we can't use it for anything um, we're just going to take the kerosene out and get rid of the rest of this, these byproducts of oil. But in this new second industrial revolution, people then were like, huh, what else can we use the oil for? And we found out that uh, gasoline and other parts of uh, crude oil are actually better than coal in many ways. 
So uh, the uh, you know gas powered engine is still the the preferred engine in our world in 2020, and we can make uh, jet fuel out of gasoline too, or out of yeah out of these various things in the oil industry. Um, but what's wild, and probably what a lot of you don't know, is that as you refine crude oil out of the ground, you can turn it into like a hundred different things. And so today, the vast majority of our world is entirely built on oil, okay? You've got tar, you've got asphalt, you've got plastic, Forget everything's made out of plastic, rubber, lubricant, wax, and all the different scales of, of liquid fuels are all made out of crude oil. Crude oil will be the most valuable commodity in the world for the rest of human history. Uh, crude oil is still a major, major player in the world economy today. Uh, don't, don't mess around with oil. Everybody wants it. It's black gold, okay? So, but, uh, but yeah, knowing that plastic is made out of oil, that's, that's always been kind of interesting to me. Um, but yeah, got to get that oil, kids. Get it. All right, moving on. Okay, and now we get to these two dudes, making people fly. All right, the Wright brothers invented the airplane, and uh, the big idea for how an airplane finally worked was the shape of the wing, okay? You've gotta angle the wing at a specific uh, level, and that way you can give your plane some lift, and uh, you can fly, believe it or not. Um, and yeah, they only invented this thing like uh, 106 years ago, so how how far have we come? You know, it's probably kinda, kind of wild um but yeah so they got the airplane that happened at the very very end of the second industrial revolution and of course the airplane changes the world uh usually whenever i teach high school i always like ask the class like has anybody never been in an airplane before i usually get like one kid in every class and then i'm like oh man you gotta you gotta fly you gotta get up there in the sky and travel around and uh of course once we do have the airplane it only improves from there and then we got spaceships and like, I'm telling you, kids, history's just on, on double speed once you get in the Industrial Revolution. Everything just happens so quickly, and uh, the, the factories of the world are just propelling history at an exponential rate. Um, all right, let's talk about some communication technology. So the Telegraph by Samuel Morse, uh, he's known for Morse Code, um, here's a, the picture of the original telegraph. It was, you could sort of think about it like the original text message, but uh, you would just, uh, it would send these little beeps and boops over uh, a uh, electrical line and people would translate it. Um, I think there actually are phone apps today where you can uh, play around with Morse code and send Morse code to your friends. I think that's fun. Yeah, it's a callback to history. Uh, and then Alexander Graham Bell, he invented the telephone. So here he is using his invention. It's kind of funny. There's the receiver end and the speaker end. And uh, originally, people had to manually connect phone lines. Um, but all this has been way improved over time. Um, but these are the, uh, the, the basics of what we got today in smartphones. So it's uh, kind of cool. They're inventing this stuff, and it's being improved on more and more over history. Um, okay, and now let me comment on our environment, because... This is what we really now have to focus on. By burning all this coal and burning all this oil, we are now starting to seriously pollute the world. I'm gonna tell you this straight up. Throughout the entirety of world history, humans did some pollution, but the amount of pollution they did was basically negligible, okay? Like, functionally, there was zero pollution on planet Earth before the year 1800. As soon as these factory economies get going and we're burning 200 million tons of coal every year and we're burning so many millions of barrels of gasoline every year, all those uh, those like plumes of smoke and soot, they just sort of get caught up in our atmosphere and to a degree they eventually get processed back in the earth but for a bigger degree they kind of just stay there. And... Um, yeah, this smog soot, it's releasing mercury, lead, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, heavy metals, all this stuff into the air. Not good for nature, not good for humans, okay? Uh, like, they definitely are proof that asthma, breathing difficulties, brain damage, cancer, neurological disorders, premature death, all this stuff 
can come from being exposed to some of this industrial pollution. Um, and so many of these early factories just didn't really understand this. Uh, it was pretty common to just, oh, hey, we've, we've you know, melted all this, this stuff, and oh, hey, we're melting all these oil. Well, we're not going to use any of these uh, refined oil, so let's just throw it in the river. Um, people didn't really make the connection that the environment will be affected, and we are absolutely dealing with the fallout of a lot of these decisions to this day. Um, oh, hold on. Yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting primary source that I found. It's wild to me that this thing exists. So um, this is from a newspaper that was published in 1912. All right, so this is a, 108 years ago. Science Notes and News. Coal consumption affecting climate. The furnaces of the world are now burning about 2, million, no, 2 billion tons of coal a year. When this is burned, uniting with oxygen, it adds about 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere yearly. This tends to make the air a more effective blanket for the Earth and to raise its temperature. The effects may be considerable in a few centuries. Okay, like, it's wild that people today are debating about global warming when people sort of saw this coming 108 years ago um like it's it's there and they predicted it they knew what they were doing and now it's uh it's up to us in the modern world to to address um what's going on but you, you know the sad thing kids are like oh they were so bad in the past i i'm pretty confident we're burning five billion tons of coal every year like it's it's probably double it's probably worse you know it, it, nothing is being slow sl nothing is slowing down everything is only accelerating uh, especially if you look at China and India in the modern world today, because they're now sort of going through the Industrial Revolution finally. So, uh, yeah, these are some deep, deep concepts that uh, we're going to have to reconcile with. Come up with some solutions. Putting that on your generation, because that's, that's sort of what continually happens. Just pass it down the line, I guess. Uh, all right, I'll talk about this in the next video. All right, peace out.